During my last visit to the scrapyard, one of the guys there offered me to have a look at a couple of golden processors, as he described the little plastic bag in the corner containing about 40 CPUs. From this bag I took 5 CPUs, which did cost quite a bit of money, around 55 US dollars to be precise. And here are 4 of them. The AMD K6 is the 233 MHz version. I took it because I do not yet have this CPU with that frequency in my collection. Then there is an Intel 486DX2 with 66 MHz. I have the CPU already twice in my collection, but when I tested them recently, I learned that they are not working. The third CPU is a Cyrex CX486 S40. I do not have any experience with Cyrex CPUs to be honest, so I am looking forward to testing such a CPU in the future. And finally there is a little mystery CPU. Its markings are covered by a heatsink, but on the back it says i66. So it is an Intel CPU and most probably it is another 486DX2 with 66 MHz. By now you may have already noticed that the pins are badly bent. Well, what to expect if the storage solution of choice was a plastic bag? All CPUs suffer from bent pins and some are in really bad shape. I can already hear some of you say, dude, you overpaid for those CPUs, especially because they are in bad condition. Yes, I took a chance, but I haven't shown you the fifth CPU, the one that caught my attention while going through the bag of golden processors. This is an Intel Pentium Overdrive with 83 MHz, and it is for the 486 platform. Yes, you heard that right, you can get a Pentium for socket 3. Now there are already a lot of nice videos about the CPU from other YouTubers like Mike over at vSwitch0. He gives a nice history about the CPU and even creates his own cooling solution. Mine still has the original heatsink on, and I will keep it that way. Unfortunately, I am missing the fan. I will keep an eye out for one of them, and hopefully one day I can make this CPU whole again. And of course, this CPU suffers from bent pins too, all 234 of them. Some are slightly bent, others almost touch the ceramic plate. A CPU like this in working condition will cost you anything between 100 and 160 US dollars on eBay, depending on its condition and if the fan is present. If I get those pins straightened, and if the CPU works after that, then I guess it was well worth spending those 55 US dollars on 5 CPUs. For today, I just want to straighten the pins of the CPU and test if the CPU actually works. In the background you will see footage of me working on the pins, while I tell you a little bit about this chip and the method I use to straighten those pins. As you can see, the pins are gold plated. I guess this is where the term golden processor comes from. I have seen many different techniques to straighten pins, and most of them seem to work, to a certain degree. I have seen people using razor blades or a metal sheet in credit card form to bend multiple pins back into place. However, with pins bent like on this CPU, this technique will probably not be very efficient or simply impossible. Then there are mechanical pencils that have a metal tip with a hole. I think this is a good tool, but also has weaknesses. First, the metal tip may scratch the pins of the CPU. And second, if you insert the entire pin into the mechanical pencil, you may not see if the pin bends correctly straight up and into the position you'd like it to. You may end up needing multiple attempts until one pin is straight. The gap between the pin and the mechanical pencil plays a role, as well as how badly the pins are bent. I like to see how each pin is bending back into place, because then I can adjust the position from where I apply pressure to the pin. My choice of bending equipment is toothpicks and those wooden cuticle pushers you can see in beauty salons for money and pedicures. The cuticle pushers are quite a bit thicker than toothpicks, provide a nice grip and are soft enough to not scratch the pins. And at all times I have the perfect view of the pin I am bending. Almost all pins bend in reverse at the exact location where they were deformed. So they become really straight, almost to a point where you no longer can see that they almost touch the ceramic at one point. But then there are some pins that require pressure from two sides, to remove or fix multiple curves on a pin. This work requires time and a lot of patience, because this task has to be done 234 times. Fixing the pins for the entire CPU took me a bit over an hour. Now let me tell you a bit about the Intel Pentium Overdrive, a Pentium CPU for the Socket 3 platform. The Intel Pentium Overdrive has a Pentium core, with a Pentium floating point unit and the Pentium superscalar architecture. The original Pentium for Socket 4 was built using an 800nm process and required 5V to operate. 
Our overdrive CPU here requires only 3.3 volts on the core and is built using a 600 nanometer process. That suggests that the original Pentium core, which was introduced in March 1993, was not the donor for this technology. It was rather the next iteration, codenamed P54, which was available for socket 5 and 7 and was released in October 1994. It fits into the timeline as well, because the Pentium Overdrive with 63 MHz was released in February 1995. And the 83 MHz version about 6 months later, in September of the same year. The Pentium core, however, required significant modifications to make it compatible with the Socket 3 platform. You may know that Pentium CPUs have a 64-bit data bus to memory. That is why you must install memory in pairs for Pentium platforms, but for a Socket 3 motherboard, a single stick of 72-pin memory is enough, saturating the 32-bit data bus to the CPU. Intel had to cut the data bus from the Pentium in half, from 64 to 32 bits. This of course reduces the performance of the CPU significantly. To make up for this shortcoming, Intel increased the level 1 cache of this CPU to a massive 32 kilobytes, something we will only see in later Pentium MMX models. The Pentium has two pipelines that allow it to complete two instructions per clock cycle in many cases. The main pipe can handle any instruction, while the other can handle the most common simple instructions. This simultaneous and parallel execution of instructions is not present in 486 CPUs. As I mentioned before, the Pentium Overdrive requires 3.3 volts for the core, but because there were also 5 volt 486 CPUs, for which the Pentium Overdrive was supposed to be a replacement, Intel decided to put a voltage regulator on the package. This way, the Pentium Overdrive is compatible to boards that only support 5 volts to power CPUs. Once I was done bending all the pins back into place, I went over the CPU one more time, making small adjustments that just made the results this tiny bit better. I am sure it will not feel like a brand new CPU when inserting it into a socket, but maybe the socket will do the rest and align the pins further. Well, we will see very soon. Now we just clean the CPU with isopropyl alcohol and we are ready to test it in one of my 486 systems. And here is the result. All pins have been straightened. One by one. Let me know in the comments if you would have expected such an outcome. I am super happy with the result. Not a single pin broke or was bent in such a bad way that I had to replace it. Now let's have a look at the motherboard in which we will test the CPU. This is a Soyo SY4SAW2, which was given to me by a viewer from Germany. It is perfect for this test because, based on information in the manual, it supports Pentium Overdrive CPUs. Let's see how well our CPU with the straightened pins fit into the socket. Ok, this is not how the CPU was when I was done with bending the pins. There was some slight resistance which caused the CPU not to fall into the socket like this. But after I installed the CPU once, the socket did the rest of the work and we are left with a CPU that feels like a new one when installing it. Now the CPU just needs to work. This board has a lot of jumpers to be set for the correct operation of the CPU. Luckily the manual is very detailed and clear about what jumpers need to be set. And this is the moment we have all been waiting for. Does this Pentium overdrive work? Yeah, I spent quite some time debugging this issue. It was so bad that I had to leave this project for the next day, because I was getting nowhere. But this will be the topic of another video. After many more hours, I finally reached the boot screen. And we see the Pentium Overdrive reporting in. The CPU reduces the multiplier from 2.5 to 1 when no fan is attached. That is why we see the CPU frequency set to 33 MHz, the speed of the system bus. There are hacks to make it work at the full frequency, but I want to try to find an original fan first. I can always make the mod later. So what else is there to say about this CPU, apart from it being a little bit of an oddity? I find it interesting that Intel went to that length to modify its Pentium to work on Socket 3 platforms, especially since the CPU's performance would be significantly hampered by the 32-bit memory bus. So let me know what you want to see me do with this CPU. 
I know there are benchmarks on YouTube, like Quake that tremendously benefits from the better floating point unit, but I wonder if we can see and feel other benefits. We can also look into simple benchmarks, a fan mod or even overclocking. Of course, if you have suggestions on what to do with the CPU, let me know in the comments. And this is all I have for you today. If you enjoyed today's Bending Bonanza, then please like the video and subscribe to my channel. And thank you to all my Patreons for your invaluable support. Thanks for watching and I will see you in one of my other videos.